Welcome to Operating in Real Time, a video series brought to you by Bridgeforth LLP. In this series, we'll be sitting down and discussing the how-tos and importance of understanding CapEx strategies and how to implement them into your ag businesses. In this series, we'll be talking with Brock Peterson. Brock Peterson is a partner here at Bridgeforth LLP with an expertise in CapEx strategies. A little bit about Brock's background. Brock has an ag economics degree from Kansas State as well as an MBA in finance. He served in pre previous roles as a corporate accountant for Sprint, a CFO of Swine Integrators, and CEO of Opal Foods, as well as continuing to run and be the owner and director of operations for Ag Building Solutions as well as his work here with Bridgeforth. I'm super excited to sit down with Brock. Not only is he all of these things, but he's also a fellow Cliftonite. It's not very often you get to team up with somebody from the small town of 400 people that you're from. Excited for this conversation and excited for you guys to hear what Brock has to say. Brock, where do you join us for him on this lovely Thursday afternoon? Glad to join you, Levi. I'm down here in Bentonville, Arkansas. It's an overcast kind of drizzly day and I think we're going to start getting colder. We're in the mid fifties right now, but I think that's as high as it's going to be for the next four or five days. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. It was overcast. Uh, when I'm working in the office, I like the sweatshirt and shorts look and I had to run up and downtown a few times today. I'm like, Ooh, it's, <laughs> it's time to button up a little bit better than that. Winter, but it looks like we got one more, one more go at it here. Oh, for sure. For sure. So let's just go ahead and dive right into it. Um, I want to just start and just kind of get your opinion on how you perceive CapEx um, and why you believe it to be such an important, you know, statistic in, in people's businesses. So especially in the agriculture se sector, capital expenditures, CapEx, is such a huge part of what, how we spend our dollars, um, whether it be at tractors or buildings or dairy equipment, poultry equipment, those things outside of the purchase of the land is generally the largest expense that any producer will have. And navigating when to spend those dollars, how to spend those dollars, what to spend them on, really will help determine how successful or profitable a business will be, an agriculture business especially, over the next many years. Because most capital expenditures are between five and 30 years of, of of, uh, of asset life. So if you take a, a tractor over a combine, those are five to 10 year assets. You take a building for poultry or for hogs or dairy, those are 20 to 30 year assets. So what you decide to spend on today, you have to live with for many, many years. Yeah, and it's I like those numbers too, the five to 30 and, and realizing that that's not something that I've thought about is the duration on that. And this is kind of a loaded question here, but how often do you think the planning duration is for that? So <laughs> is that something that happens because we had a great year and we've got some money that, that we can put up that extra barn or, or, or grow? Because um, like you said, those are durations of, of five to 10 or even up to 20 years. But sometimes I feel like the uh, the planning process can be like five months or two months or, you know, or two days. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that's kind of a loaded question. What usually sparks that and in, in what you're seeing out there? So if I had my checkbook with me, I would pull out, I would show you an example of, hey, I opened my checkbook up and I've got a whole bunch of money in it and yeah. I don't want to pay taxes. So For sure. maybe I better go buy a tractor or build a building or something. And there is not the thought process around, hey, do we need that? But more importantly, need, want, whatever is, will that asset that we're going to spend capital expenditures on produce more money for us than some alternative, whether it's sitting it in a savings account, investing it in the stock market, buying another piece of ground, buying a tractor, buying a combine. What is the best use of the money that I have? And maybe the best use is to pay the taxes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh. the planning needs to go into it. And I would say probably the longer the duration of the asset you're buying, the more planning that should go in it. If you're buying a tractor, yeah, you should plan some. But if you're if you're building a 30-year dairy barn or a 30-year uh, poultry processing facility, those things you probably got to sit down and say, hey, do I have customers that need the product I'm going to produce out of that asset? What will I get paid for that? It'll be, have to be an educated guess. You know, what type of operations do I need to have in place? Do I have enough people to operate that new asset? Do I have the right people? Um, am I just doing it because 
I have another kid in the business and I think I need to build another dairy barn. These are the things that the planning needs to happen as, as long a duration as possible to you're comfortable with the decision that you're spending. Some of these projects now, these large dairies, large poultry operations, you're talking five, 10, $20 million of, of capital. Oh, wow. And that is a lot of money. And probably the more, the more analysis and thought you can put into it as well, the more comfortable your bank's going to be loaning you the money to help you with that capital expenditure as well. For sure. I thought Jay had uh, a pretty interesting one that he put in a presentation earlier this week or, or last month, excuse me. Um, and it basically was like, is there a need for it? I feel like a lot of the guys, what happens is, especially on the smaller scale, I know as you get up, obviously it gets a little bit better. Um, but a lot of the guys, it's something that they have in the back of their mind for the last five to 10 years that, hey, we should really do that. Or we're looking at doing that. And then maybe a good year comes in. And so they just go ahead and bite the bullet. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the times they're not asking, you know, why did we have such a good year last year? Is that going to continue next year? Um, and, and, and I agree with you. I feel like the tax man is, is kind of the boogeyman in a lot of the situations. But sometimes that is the best thing. Sometimes paying the taxes and having the cash on hand um, to move forward with and, and to be able to to time your entry um, is a lot of, can be a lot better than just, you know, the reacting right, right away. Yeah, most definitely. And in a rate, in an environment like we're in today where taxes seem to be going up, maybe you're better off paying the taxes today at the percentage rates they are than paying them tomorrow. That's an evaluation that you need to take into account. Now, I don't think you should look at that either way. I think taxes, you should forget about the tax consequences as the first blush and then approach that. Once you're done with your analysis, say, okay, now we're to the tax consequences. Does this continue to make sense? And all, all too often, though, if the tax man is the first consideration. So yeah, I feel like it's the factor instead of a factor yes. uh, in a lot of those, in, which is, <laughs> I don't know, it's just, it's, a lot of business guys, especially getting started, that's just drilled into your head over and over again about that being the, the biggest ability is to help control your taxes and, and, and to understand that. But sometimes I know it hurts, but it's okay to write that check. <laughs> to be fair, where most of that comes from is the small, original smaller family farm that cash was king. And the, le the less amount of taxes you could pay... Yeah, it made sense. Then you kept your you you kept your your uh your cash in your pocket. You needed a new tractor anyway, or you needed to buy a planter or whatever it was. But as a percent of what you were doing as a business was much smaller, and so but that mentality continues in our head. And no one wants to write Uncle Sam the check because they don't see <laughs> you. At some point, you're going to write the check. So. And it's becoming harder and harder to manipulate the, the income around, especially as your operations grow. You want consistency of earnings. So, again, yeah, you're right. Taxes should be a factor, not the factor. For sure. Um, and so as you look around the, the ag, I'll just do the ag industry in general as we're kind of explaining CapEx here a little bit. Um, what you're seeing out there, is there anybody or any industry in the ag, and I'm sure it's specific to each you know, producer as well, um, that does a really good job with their CapEx or is maybe forced to do a better job with their CapEx because of how, you know, how things operate as far as dairy, poultry? Um, is there anything that, that you would give a, a higher grade and maybe one that you would give a little bit lower grade right now? So I, I will say this. I don't know if there's an industry, whether it's hogs or dairy or cattle or row crop or whatever it may be, poultry, that does it better or worse. I think there are players in all those industries that do it really well and players that do it really bad. And it's not large players are doing it really well and small players are doing it really bad. It is across the board. There's some large players in really good industries that do CapEx planning really bad. And there's some small players that do it really good. I think it really comes down to the, the leaders of those organizations. If they're committed to, and Jay's laid this out, where do you want to get to? What do you want to do? Um, where do you want to be five years from now? If you have that plan in place, if you know you're going to do your, your, your estate planning and how you're going to pass the family farm down, and we, need, we, need, we know we need to grow um, from this level of revenue, 
to a next level revenue or a number of cows or sows or whatever it is, and you have that plan in place, you'll be better at the capital expenditures because you won't jump at everything that's offered and looks good. You'll, you'll have that plan. No, we don't need this because that doesn't fit into our long-term plan. So it goes back to what Jay continues to talk about around, hey, where do you want to go and how are we going to get there? And then you can start stepping into your capital, your CapEx plans on how you're going to go to get there. And that plan then will also include how operationally you're going to, you're going to support that CapEx. Because CapEx just doesn't, you don't just spend the money once and you're done. You spend the money on a large CapEx expenditure, and then you have to operate that. And if you don't have the people and processes in place today to operate that, that CapEx will not return what you think it's going to return. I think it's interesting, just like it all kind of goes down to a bigger picture of what is what is the plan? I know that's a really easy way to simplify it, but sometimes, you know, you, th- you think that a lot of these businesses have that and some of them have just grown because, you know, they got in at a right time and things have, have worked well. Um, and then usually it comes to a head where they ha- they're forced to, to have a plan or to have that harder conversation. So I always find that interesting of, of who's really um, reactive and who's really proactive and in, in getting ahead of a lot of those numbers. One thing I think that's, that is a problem when we start talking about CapEx is we always think, oh, we've got money or someone will lend us money. Probably a lot of now is someone will lend us money to do a project. We just should go do a project. Stop, time out. You know, where are we? Where do we want to go? And how do we want to get there, right? And those questions have to be answered first. And CapEx should be part it's again it's like tax taxes is is a factor not the factor cap x is a factor in your total business plan not the factor in your total business plan what's the best thing that you think a great cap x strategy brings i know the kind of the gist of this is operating in real time so my presumption of it and which is is as a younger and and learning more is to be able to move as quickly as possible if you have real time data on you know a lot of your cap x projects or or just anything in general you're able to know and then see what's coming down the line and react because you know your numbers and where you stand at those points is that kind of how you see or what do you think the big advantage of knowing your cap CapEx is. So when we start thinking about CapEx, we want to think about where we've been and how, how our business has operated. And knowing your financial numbers will give you a really key insight into that. So if you know my cost of feed for this animal producing this product is this amount, and then you put together a CapEx plan, and you're going to say your cost of feed is half of that, you probably ought to step back and say, eh, I'm probably not doing this justice. I'm probably not in the right arena here of what the expectation really is. So the faster and better you know your data, the better your CapEx plan is going to be because you're going to do your financial projections based off your history most of the time. And when someone comes in and tells you, hey, this CapEx expenditure will increase your productivity by Fifty percent. You probably ought to take a good hard look at that and say, mm, unless you're operating <laughs> the Stone Age and you're going up today, probably not. You know, history generally is a predictor of the future. But if you don't know what your history is, or your history is three years old and you don't have any recent data, a your banker's not going to be real happy about that, and b you're kind of flying blind. So the better. The more effort you can put into financial reporting and accounting, and I know everybody hates it and it's a pain to do because I just want to keep my checkbook and whatever's in my checkbook is what I have to spend. But you really need to know and not, hey, I thought I, I thought my cow produced 100 pounds of milk. I, don't know, I think. Well, is it 80? Is it 120? It could be either one. Is, have you financially made a million dollars a year or have you made $100,000 a year? Well, I don't know. I've got $500,000 in my checking account. That's not what we're talking about. We need to know the financial information. So having a good financial, I'm going to call it advisor, but whether that's a CPA, an accountant, a bookkeeper, or operator, operator that just keeps track of it. <laughs> it doesn't have to all be financial information either, right? How many yeah. pounds of feed are you feeding in your feedlot every day? 
And then how many pounds of gain are you getting? You know, those type of things are really important as you go to look at your capital expenditures and you want to determine, am I going to be able to, because ultimately when you spend capital, let's say you spend a million dollars of capital, you want that million dollars back in your pocket plus a return. And if you spend a million dollars and get 500000 back, you should have paid the taxes and kept your, kept your money. And not only that, but probably put a lot of work in there for yourself as well. Yeah. And if you're just doing it because that's what you want to do, be honest with yourself and say, I'm going to build this barn because that's what I want. Okay. That's a different story. Um, but don't kid yourself in saying this is a capital expenditure that I expect to make a return on if you don't know where you're starting. And the only way to know where you're starting is really good bookkeeping around your financial numbers, around your production numbers, all of that. That is the way the really, really good operators dial in. And I will, I will admit, some, of, some, organ, some industries capture way more data than they're ever going to use. Part of capturing data is knowing which data is important and which is not, which is actionable data and which is not. But if you're just capturing data and never look at it and never analyze it, then you're fooling yourself as well. It's just, it's just data at that point and no one's thinking about it. So someone who is good at operations or good at financial planning, good at financial reporting can help you decipher, hey, what's important to measure? And then are we measuring it? And then what does that measurement tell us? Are we doing well? Are we not? Are we doing what we expected? Are we below expectations, above expectations? If you don't know those answers and you're trying to determine how to spend money, that then becomes a little dicey. Well, and the, like the big ones that I see too is that just year over year. So it's like, what's your best month? Do, do you know that? Like, where are you making your profits at? When are you making your profits at? Is that because of the weather of that time of year? Or is what, what was the, the factor of that? So just understanding your end and the data that you can control, then you understand the data that you can't control and the effect that it has on that. I, I feel like that's a, a big one too when people are going for bigger projects. Yeah, and if you're sitting here in, in mid-March and you know May is always a month where you have a big cash crunch, and you're, you're short on cash, then maybe you shouldn't do a capital expenditure in April. Yeah. That's going to suck a lot of cash out that okay. you're going to need in May. Do you but I had to file my taxes in April. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> so knowing your history will help you predict your future. It's not always a perfect prediction, but it's better than just flying blind. Yeah, I think that's a really great transition too as we, we talk a little bit about the historical data as well as as current data especially in the times right now um what we're seeing in the in the banking world and tightening fiscal policy i think now more than ever um is, is a good time to get on top of these numbers and to know these numbers and, and to really drill down into them and i want to expand on that one thing i want to make sure everybody at least starts thinking through is as cash is king and as you try to hoard your cash or hold on to your cash to be able to take advantage of uh, distressed sales, whatever it may be, that allow you to operate your business better or more profitably, really you need to watch how your cash is being protected at your bank. One simple thing you can do, which I've done in the past at the companies that I've owned, is have the conversation with your banker around, hey, I want to set up a sweep account where my money in excess of 100000 50,000, 250,000, anything that you don't need to have on a day to day basis gets swept into an overnight government backed security that's outside of the FDIC insurance. That allows you then, if you have a million dollars in your bank account, that allows you, because 750,000 of that is not protected by FDIC. If you, can, if you sweep all but 50 grand of that every night into a federally backed T bill or whatever it is, that then gives you protection above and beyond the FDIC insurance. And it's a relatively simple solution that if your bank cannot provide to you, you probably need to reassess your banking relationship. Because okay. I've, not, I've not been at a bank when I press them that they can't do it. Most of them don't want to do it because it's extra steps, a little bit extra cost. Most banks can and should do it. 
especially for their large depositors. Probably your small local community bank that is super, super conservative in times like this is where you need to have your money. Now, I still would protect myself. Anything over $250,000, I'd be sweeping into some sort of government-backed security with your name on it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> companies, the different companies I own, yeah, we, this is something we're having a lot of discussions around right now. So, so when you when you do get to the point in a company where you get over that FDIC limit, is that something that you go into the bank and discuss with them? Or is that something yeah. that like you're opening different banks already? No, I don't do different banks. I think that's a pain in the ass. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I do one bank and I like having a cash management account that sweeps to and from a line of credit first. So let's say one day you have a million dollars and you have 500,000 drawn on the line. It sweeps over 500,000 in the line of credit and then takes the rest of the 500,000 and dumps it into a T-bill overnight. You know, an overnight T-bill. In your name. In my name. The next day, if I need it, it sweeps it back up or it sweeps off the line or whatever it is. So it's just cash management and it should be- But they're having to be a- are they having to be a brokerage to do that? The bank? Do the bank have to have a brokerage service to do that? No, no. Most banks don't, no. Uh, because they can go buy, they can go to the Fed and buy T-bills. They do it themselves, you know. That's where mm-hmm. they should park their money overnight, not 10-year T-bills. They should be <laughs> overnight T-bills. Uh, times like this, people will, will go to hard assets. Yeah. So, do you think that that will help land prices or does that worry you too on a banking crisis? Interest rates that- are going to put a cap on it, but all the capital flowing in will help keep it up too. I don't know if it goes up or down much, but it'll, I think it'll put, a, it'll put a floor underneath it, but the interest rates will put a ceiling on it. What, so so when, when that happened with the farmers, I, don't, I can't remember back when, when they went through, they kind of went through a, a banking crisis like this too, didn't they? With the, all the collateralization. In the, in the in the 80s, yeah, for sure. What, what, what kind of happened then, I guess? I don't have a good enough understanding of that. Interest rates went to 19%, 20%. So you just couldn't afford to borrow money. Um, land prices cratered. We don't have anywhere near that. Um, you know, we're at 7%. Six, seven percent. I mean, historically, yeah. that's about average. You know, our first house, I think we borrowed money at seven percent. Um, that was in 90, no, 99, 99 2000, somewhere in 98. I think the, the other part is that uh, commodities right now are doing really well. What happened in the early 80s is we had two or three years of crop failures, we had really bad commodity prices. Um, we had really high interest rates. So it was like the perfect storm of everything. So people couldn't make their loan payments. They were refinancing their loans, you know, to get out from underneath them at really high interest rates. Commodity prices were zero. Um, you know, corn was under $2. Wheat was, what, two or three bucks. Cattle were terrible. It, just, it was a perfect storm. Yeah. We don't have that right now. Now, I'm not saying we can't, but we just don't have that right now. So. Okay. Yeah. I just, I didn't know what all those, those big factors were now. It's nice once you get the knowledge to then look back and, 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 and try to put the pieces together. Um, I like yeah. to try to figure that stuff out a little bit and, and, and see what happened. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. All right. I appreciate it, Brock. I hope you guys were able to find some good piece, pieces of information in there. We're always super appreciative of any interaction that we can get. So if there's something that you'd like to hear more of or like for me to ask Brock or one of the partners, please comment it in the sections below. If you're looking to find out more information on Bridgeforth, you can find us at Bridgeforth LLP or follow us along on our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or TikTok. We post some of the clips as well. So super appreciative of everybody. And as always, we look forward to bringing you guys some more quality information to help your businesses move forward and stay family. Thanks.